it's found in Genesis 15, 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Speaking about Abraham, right after he said, look at the stars, look at the sky, and count the stars, and count the grains of the sand. If you can, so forth will be your descendants. And right after that, in verse 16, he says, and he believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. The meaning is impute or account. In that verse, God counts Abraham righteous. He imputes righteousness to Abraham as something new and un. He wasn't expecting that. He didn't have the Torah. He didn't have the scriptures. He was comfortable wherever he was at. He didn't know the meaning of who his creator was. And just because he heard what the Lord said, leave this place in your family to a place that I will show you. Came up with a description of what was to be expected. And it says that he believed the Lord. He didn't live his days to see 2022. But he knew that the Lord was going to do as he has promised. For I know the plans that I have for you. Somebody. In the noun from Hashavah, the word means thought, plan, or invention. It is used in Genesis 6, 5 about the evil thoughts of all mankind. It is used in Jeremiah about the plans that men follow. And in 2 Chronicles about creating an invention. Again, the context is about new things. Say it with me. New things. But for you to achieve the new things, you got to learn how to let go. Somebody. Let's talk about the thoughts for a minute here. Where does the thought come from? Can anybody tell me where is it that the thought comes from? I'm going to use one word, and in one word we can divide it in two. A thought comes from nowhere to now here. It's within the same spelling, the same word, the same context, and you split it in two. A thought comes from nowhere to now here. Another question that I had is, what comes first? The thoughts or the emotions? Well, apparently the emotions come first. And then we give it thought. That's why it is says what we think is what we create is our reality. There's three forms of thinking. There's the creative, and it said that it's horizontal. Thinking, that's what we call brainstorming. So you have a question, you can picture or imagine a bubble or a circle, and you have a question, that's the way the mind thinks. You see, when we're preparing a sermon or a study, we do A and then one A, two B with the dots, and then we go here, we highlight, because we think that that's our process thinking, we want to keep it aligned that way so we can follow through. But in all reality, when you have a thought, it's, it's like a bubble, it's like a circle, you have a thought right there, from that thought, others, amen, and you can picture a line connecting one to another, amen, so when you think about a plan that you have, a business that you have, a ministry that you have, you have the name, so you connect the dot to the name, and then you look for the scriptures, and you connect the dot to that scripture, and then you think about the promises of God, and you connect the dots to God, that's your creative thinking, that is your brainstorming, mm -hmm. and then you have, that's something called imagination, divergence, and then they talk about using your logic, and that's when we fail. Yeah, that's right. Come on. We love to quote to say it is common sense, but we fail to use the logic. What is common sense to you? Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. And the logic would be you have an answer. And from the answer, hallelujah, you have facts. So we go from we can use it objectively or we can use it subjectively. But that's what our thoughts are. And that one is said to be vertical. It's critical and analytical. Linear thinking. Hallelujah. So then we have here some types of thinking in order of complexity. This is 
is how we're going to use our critical thinking, our creative thinking, our analytical thinking, amen? Having used the ability, the knowledge, and the tools that Jehovah God has given us. We use knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. All of that goes into play when you have a thought. When you're acting upon that plan, that creativeness that God has placed in you, that is your origination. It is in your DNA. You know why it is in your DNA? Because when God made man, he told Adam, you are to, to name the, the, all the trees and the animals, etc., etc." Hallelujah. And then he put man to sleep. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. Yeah. That has been the theme and the topic for months now. Oh, he put Adam into a deep sleep. And it says he took his rib, one of his ribs, and from his rib he created woman. And then when he woke up, he says he presented Eve. We call it Eve in the Western culture. Her name is Chava. Nekhef, for female. And then he said, hallelujah, and presented to him Eve, and he said, she is bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And he named her. So why do you think that women can, can carry so much and go about so much and, and do so much and create so much? Because the man's origin, the, the original creation is designed for men is to create, to work, to do. The woman was to be a helper, to, to, to help him achieve his goals, achieve his plans, achieve his dreams, activate his talents and believe in him, be a cheerleader. But these days we way too feminist. These days we are powerful. We can do it all by myself. I don't need a man. Yes, yes. I can buy this house and this car by myself. And you go all over social media right now, that's a big thing now. And I thank Allah for that because it's needed to be heard. Yeah. Jesus, I need me a man. I don't know about you. God fearing, man. God. One that can shake the heavens and the earth and the earth. Yeah. Hallelujah. So why? Why can the woman achieve so much? She carries the man's DNA because she was created by his bones. She was created by his flesh. Hallelujah. Amen. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then we see here, hallelujah. Glory to God. Experience, memory, association, pattern, discernment. Discernment. Did you hear that? Recognition, reason, invention, experimentation, and intuition. All of that takes place when you have a thought. Wow. I know that's right. Jesus. Thank Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory. But most importantly, for you to let it go, Jesus. you have to operate in the metanoia. It's the Greek word, hallelujah, to transform and change your mind. And you will attain that by the teshuva, which is the repentance, to your Abba. Somebody. Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. God is so good. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. And all the ideas I have for you, says the Lord. Lord God's plans are never cast in concrete like a lot of people believe. They are flexible, adjusting to our lives as our circumstances change. It is easy to think that God has only one perfect plan, one perfect will for your life, and that if you make a mistake or sin, the plan will be forever be destroyed. Then you will have to live with second best, or then you will have to live with third best, and so on, each time you fail to meet expectations. But God does not have one perfect plan for you. He has one purpose. He has one God is full of surprises and eternal. I know that's right. Yes. Hallelujah. I know, I know, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. The word is really not have. We translate it this way because it makes sense in English, right? All countries, everywhere you go, they want to make English something, you know, big, and they're trying to make the words so universal. People don't even take time to study the etymology of how the words break down, how those words were created, and why they gave those words the meaning that they did. Yeah. <laughs> I think I done gave somebody a headache right there. <laughs> 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 
I know the plans that I have for you. The purposes, hallelujah, that I purpose for you. So we translate it this way because it makes sense in English, but in Hebrew, the verse really says, I know the plans that I plan for you. Amen. Or I know the purposes that I purpose for you. So the word for plans that we look at really um, used twice, first as a noun and then as a verb. Amen. In the second case, the verb has a little different sense. The noun is mahashava. It means new ideas. Yes. The verb is hashav. Hallelujah, which means make plans, reckon, account, or think. We already saw that this verb used to describe God's decision to see Abraham as righteous. Glory to God. Perhaps there's more to this verse than simply that God has purposes for our lives. Can it be that God's purpose includes being counted as righteous? That sense of the verb is certainly in God's purpose for each of us. In fact, without the sense of the verse, none of God's plans will ever meet his purpose. I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Prosper. It's the word for shalom. It primarily means peace, but it also has the meaning perfect, whole, complete, prosperity, well, health, and safety. It is far more than just the absence of conflict and strife. It encompasses the entire range of all being. Therefore, it includes spiritual and physical completeness. Hallelujah. Harmony and fulfillment. But shalom comes from a Hebrew culture, not a Greek culture. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The word is couched in relationship, not possessions. Ultimately, shalom is about our relationship to the one who can provide all of us of completeness for us. Without the primary relationship as a fundamental purpose of life, all of the other aspects of living are unsteady. They will lack a solid foundation. In this verse, the active agent is God. We do not find prosperity, peace, and wholeness on our own. That is impossible. God's direct activity in our lives is the basis of shalom. The intention of God's purpose for us is shalom. A lot of people want to put their happiness on the material thing, on the possessions, on relationships. Yeah. I know that's right. And they think that they try to equal that to happiness. Uh -huh. But my question to you is, do you have peace? Yeah. You have peace? Yeah. You have happiness. Yeah. Everything else that. comes along right after that. Yeah. Amen. I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Literally, this should say, and not for evil. First, it means that God's new idea for you are for your good. His purposes are to bring you shalom, peace, and not evil. He is not a vengeful or malicious God. You know, a lot of times that we, we picture God, you know, you know, with a whip, and everything you do is whoosh. And everything is a no, no, no. I don't know if it's God's will. I don't know if it's God's purpose. Well, I got to pray about it first, and I got to see. And everything is a no, and everything you do, God is so angry. He's going to strike you dead. God has no plan to do you any evil. In fact, his plan is just the opposite. The word for evil is ra. The root behind it as a noun that means rotten, spoiled, for good, or good for nothing. It is most often used in conjunction with the word to top, which means good. The first instance of this word is in the Garden of Eden in the expression tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Bible recognizes that men often have varying ideas about what he is. We acknowledge his fact about cultural differences every day. Sometimes it surprises us when we know, hallelujah, what other cultures consider morally correct. Amen. However, even though the Bible recognizes this fact, the final verdict on good and evil is always in God's hands. Since he is the judge of the world, his determination about what is evil is the last word on the subject. If God says that some act or event is evil, there is no negotiation on this matter. The essence of evil is disobedience to God's will. It is progressive. Evil begins with the lack of acknowledgement. We do not recognize God as God. We refuse to give him honor as the creator. We, we form this lack of acknowledgement. We proceed to an attitude of ingratitude. We are not thankful for what God has done. Refusal and ingratitude become ingrained as habit and compulsion. The result is that we do injury to others and to ourselves. 
Sometimes we even set expectations. And sometimes I try to be very careful about setting expectations. Because when things don't happen the way I wanted them to happen, I get upset and frustrated. And I can save me the heartache and the headache if I don't set such expectations. I know the plans that I have for you. God tells us not only that he has no plans to harm us, but his plans and purposes will keep us from self-inflicted harm. God's plan is for harmony, unity, peace, and life. Ignoring his plans for us will lead to strife, hostility, injury, and for sure, death. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future with hope. This last part of the verse reiterates the intention of God's plans. God has two goals in mind. The first is a future. The word is ahabit. What's unusual about this word is that it literally means afterward, backwards, or after part. Doesn't it sound like it's contradictory? I'm going to take you somewhere. So how can it be about the future? It is said that the Hebrew concept of time is like a man rowing a boat. <laughs> he sees where he has been, but the future is toward his back. Moses asked God to see his glory. God wouldn't Still have the Torah and go 
and, 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 and poverty and, and, and violence and, and, and raping. And we were, uh, Samuel was explaining how when they mentioned raping is not so much of the physical in a forced intercourse, but much more raping the, 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 the innocence and abusing certain things that they had. And we see that the whole city of Sodom and Gomorrah was like that. And it is said that Lot's wife also was already with that type of spirit. And Lot takes these angels into his house. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. You are worthy. Hallelujah. And it says here, Hallelujah. When Lot and his wife ran from the destruction of Sodom, they were told not to look back. And everybody knows this story. Lot's wife did not look back and she saw her future. She looked back, but she saw her future. You know why? Because that's what she was about. That's the thing that she was leaving behind, although that she was instructed not to look back. There's nothing left there for you, hallelujah. When you visit or revisit your past, it's for you to have a spirit of gratitude of what God has done for your life, even though we have not understand the processes. But sometimes it's too painful, but we stay stuck in that pain. Yes, yes, yes. We don't make it our business to become better people every single day. She looked back, she saw into her future because that's what was expected for her. Yes. It is also said, when you look over your shoulder to somebody else, what does that tell you? If I have you here and I'm looking over you, what, I'm better than you? Come on. Am I looking at you like, oh, look at you and look where I'm at? Jesus. So could it have been that Lot's wife was not only recognizing what she was leaving behind, but also like, okay, God saved me from this, but what about y'all? What about because a lot of times we like to throw God's name out there like it's nothing, like it's candy. Yes. Abusing also. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah, like Back into the future, it's time to let it go. Time to let it go, you know, and I don't want to have to leave here without giving just a little piece of myself. Amen, hallelujah. Glory to God, and it's something uh, powerful that happened here yesterday when these women of God were bringing forth the word and they were speaking about, Pastor Gail was saying that, that, that she, the Lord took her to when she was a little girl, four years old. Amen. And she had to write and she had to make a list and she had to let go. She's still learning how to let go of certain things. And I experienced that at the age of 23 when I gave my heart to the Lord. But just last week, I experienced it again. And it is no coincidence. I was at ShopRite doing some grocery shopping. And afar, I saw some uh, uh, corn cakes. You know what those are? The little corn cakes, the round one not. And that took me back to when I was five years old. It took me back to Broad Street in North New Jersey. When we were homeless, we didn't have a place to stay. Four kids, my mother and her boyfriend at the time. We were evicted from our apartment. We were sleeping in Branchville Park, North New Jersey when it was winter. We had not eaten for days. And my mother was hungry and they scrapped up some change and her boyfriend went into this cafe and he bought a cup of coffee and one of those corn cakes. She loved it with, with uh, uh, toasted with butter and jelly. It tastes so good. And I paused for a moment in the middle of this aisle looking at these corn cakes and there's tears coming down my eyes. Because my mother's no longer here with us. And it took me back to that little girl, five years old. I smelled the scent of these toasted corn muffins. I smelled the coffee that was spilled all over us while it was hot. Just because we asked mom that we were hungry, could we have a piece? Had it been that I had not yet let that go? I remember when we were worried. I remember my mother's smile. I remember conversations that was had at that very moment. I remember seeing my siblings' face of fear and hunger. Pastor Norma was saying yesterday that the Lord gave her a similar experience and she's been going a lot through her past not understanding why. And it's because there's things that we gotta learn how to let go in order to get to that next level in God's purpose for our lives. There is things that we act upon because we hide behind ministry. We hide, we hide behind God and the church and we don't want to confront those things that really hurt deep down inside of us. Hallelujah. But the Lord said it is time to let it go. Divine healing ministry. It is time to let it go. But what I want to do in your life, I don't care how old you are, from the youngest to the oldest, you have a lot to give. Give for grace by what grace you have received. There is so Yes. 
I know that it isn't comfortable. I know that it hurts. 